Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Excited to have you guys here. I'm excited to be able to try and see if we can teach as many people on some GIS things. The idea for these uh, live streams is to start from scratch and teach you um, kind of the basics about GIS, and then we'll get into, as we do more, we'll do some hands-on things. Um, the idea is to have a series of these classes and get you up and running on GIS. For today, we're not going to use any software. After today's session, we will get into using some software. Um, okay, GIS. What is GIS? It stands for Geographic Information Systems. And the whole purpose of a GIS is really to, um, really to model Earth and to make smart decisions. So the idea is, can we collect data about features and things we see on Earth, put them on our computer and use it to make decisions without having to constantly go out in the field and looking for stuff. So the, the sole purpose of a GIS is to model Earth on our computer so we can use it for decision making. <clears throat> we have um, to, to represent features that are on Earth in the computer, we have three basic primitives. We have points, lines, and polygons. And just depending on what you're trying to map and what you're trying to model, you will pick one of these three primitives to, to show that feature on a map. Um, an example here is, you know, if we have fire hydrants or even uh, street signs or, um, you know, sensors that we might have in the ground, Anything that doesn't occupy a whole lot of space, but it can be represented by a, small, a point, we will create a point feature class and put in those locations. Then we have linear features that are very good for things like roads. Um, sometimes we want a road to just represent where it is, and so we'll do a center line of a road. <clears throat> sometimes we may do road as polygons if we want the, the pavement areas and stuff. So lines are great for things like roads, rivers, uh, pipelines. And then we have areas, uh, polygons. Polygons represent areas on the ground. <clears throat> so if you wanted to draw land ownership or a forest or a lake, we would typically do that as polygon features. The way we store this information on the back end is a point just has a single x, y location. A line has a series of points that are connected together and they make up a line. A polygon is just like a line. It's a series of x, y locations. The only difference being that the start coordinate and the end coordinate is exactly the same. So it actually closes that polygon out and become closes that line out and becomes a polygon. We have two major data structures in a GIS. One is a vector data system, which is what is what we represent everything with this point, line, and polygon. We have a second data st structure, which is called a raster data structure. And the way it works is imagine if we were in, a, in your rooms that you're in right now, imagine that someone drops a fishnet over every, every object in that room. And then each one of those little squares of the fishnet represents whatever is, it's falling on. So if it's a table, then that little square becomes a table. If it's floor, then that square becomes floor. So raster is essentially taking this whole inside, outside, wherever it is, you drop a fresh net and whatever occupies that cell becomes the object that it's trying to represent. So each cell stores a value of what it is. And this uh, we'll look at the types of data it stores. So in that case, when we are trying to represent a point line or a polygon, a point would essentially occupy one whole cell. A line will essentially occupy a bunch of cells that are connected. 
And a polygon will be a, a, a collection of um, contiguous cells that will represent a polygon. The other thing we need in this cell is really some sort of a coordinate. So we kind of need to know where that first cell starts. You know, is its coordinate 1, 1, 0, 0, or what? And we're going to look at coordinate systems in a second, but essentially it needs a series of rows and columns, and then it needs a coordinate to define where on Earth it is. Vector data? <clears throat> Vector data is great for discrete objects. Um, you know, county boundaries, municipality boundaries, uh, forest areas, lakes, rivers, whatever it is. Um, but points, lines, polygons, any discrete objects are great with vector data. Raster is great for continuous data. So things like elevation. Elevation doesn't have a line going through it, right? Your, your land just moves up and down very continuously, unless you're at a cliff and then you get a drop. But continuous data is where raster uh, works out really well. So in this case, you can see there's some aerial satellite and imagery, there's elevation data. In this case, vegetation has been generated out of satellite imagery, so it's saying it's raster. But vegetation can be discrete as well. You know, you have a forest that becomes a, gra a farmland, that's a very discrete boundary. So vegetation could go either way. So just to give you a quick example of uh, what we're looking at, we also organize everything as thematic layers. A thematic layer is data of like type that we make a collection of. So streets could be one, land use could be another, administrative boundaries and like, you know, many more. I mean, your thematic layers are created by you and you can call them what you want. Typically in a thematic layer, we will only put like objects there. So in this case, streets is probably a vector polygon, but we would put all streets together, but we would probably not put railroads in the same data because the information you want to collect on a street will typically be things like maybe the name of the street and maybe how many lanes it is and the pavement type. But a railroad is also a line feature class, but I don't have pavement type on railroads. I may need to collect some other information for a railroad, like uh, you know how, how thick is the gauge and maybe what its base layer is or something. So there's two things that define what becomes a theme. Points, lines, and polygons have to sit separately. You can never mix fire hydrants with streets in one thematic layer. They have to be different because their geometries are different. And then once you decide on what the geometry is, you then have to decide what type of data is it. And depending on what type of data it is, you make collections of stuff together like that. Um, Okay, so vector and raster data. Let's kind of just look at some things and say, what would this be? Uh, city parks. Chances are that's a vector because it's got a very discrete boundary on it. Bike trails, I would consider it a vector and a line feature class. Wind speeds, that I would pick a raster data set to represent it because they're very continuous. You don't know where the wind goes from a 10 miles per you know, 10 miles versus two miles. It just kind of is a gradient that it goes through. Uh, bus stops are discrete. Um, you can make them polygons, but in this case, bus stops could also be points. If you don't want to, sh if you don't want to show the whole shelter and everything else that may be at a bus stop, but you just want to show where the, you know, the stop is, it could be a polygon, a point as well. Uh, soil types could go either ways. You could do raster or vector. A lot of times, soils are generated out of other raster data sets. Uh, imagery could be a part of it, so it could go either way. Population by state. State boundaries are very discrete. I would make that a vector data set, a polygon vector data set. Water temperature, once again, is continuous. 
and I would use a um, continuous raster data set to represent it. Um, but the one thing you will see very often is, especially in elevation, elevation is a continuous data set, but a lot of times we create contours, which are discrete lines just to help us kind of visualize it and stuff. Um, historically, we drew maps on paper and contours were kind of an interpolation of what the height was for a given area. Um, we still use contours, but elevation rasters are way more accurate. The next big concept in a GIS is you have to understand scale. Scale is very intuitive and simple. Um, when you sit on a plane, you know, when you're first on the ground and you look at things around you, you see a lot of resolution. So let's imagine we're on a plane on the ground and we're looking at a river and we can see the banks of the river. If I had to map that, I would potentially map it as a polygon. But now I start, the plane takes off and I go a little higher and the same river appears smaller, but I can still see its banks. And I go even higher and now the stream almost just becomes like a thread in the landscape and it looks like just a line. So depending on how you're collecting data, your representation of the same object is very different. For example, here we can see the boundary of Kenya and Nairobi is just a point. But if I was on the ground trying to do a Nairobi boundary, it would not be a point and it would be a polygon. Um, a scale represents, the ratio represents one unit of something is so many units on the ground. So say my unit was a, a centimeter. <clears throat> one centimeter is equal to in reality, a hundred million centimeters. When you do this, this is a ratio, you divide one by 100, it's 100. a scale. Um, if I represent this as a, hang on, let me just, uh, can, can everyone just mute whoever is in there, please? Just mute yourself, appreciate it. Um, if we had to represent this as a, as on the ground, it would be a large scale because one divided by 100,000 is a larger number than one divided by 100 million. Um, so here we are, you know, with uh, scale is important because depending on whether you're collecting data in the field, if you're on the ground using GPS collecting data, that's a one-to-one -one scale. You walk one centimeter, it represents one centimeter on the ground. But a lot of times our data comes from aerial photography or satellite imagery. And depending on what the scale of that source product is, you will map things differently. Unfortunately, in the digital world, what's happened is a lot of people don't understand scale and they take data sets together and blend them together because the computer lets you do it, but they don't match up. And that's when you get things like a road going right through a pond because the pond was collected at a different scale to the road. And so now when you mash them together, it doesn't look right. And sometimes if you don't realize you're doing that, you can make decisions that are incorrect. So scale is an important concept. Um, data inputs to a GIS, uh, uh, the most you know field data collection with GPS units is probably the the, the most commonly used method of getting data into a system. Um, the second commonly used way is either satellite imagery or aerial photography. Our historical maps that you see are in, um, you know, just the paper maps we see that have been generated over time, those were typically aerial, aerial sources. They would fly a plane, they'd take pictures, they'd come back, they collate those pictures together, then they trace on top of it and you get digital data. Today, we have tons of satellites collecting data. And the way that works is you've got a, the electromagnetic spe spectrum, right? There's everything out there. 
the visible portion of that spectrum is very small. The visible portion is what we, as the human eye, can see. So when we look at a tree, it's green. So typically what happens is um, we collect, we take a photograph, and we assign the red band becomes the red things, red, green, blue, right? We've got three representations on our computer screen. We put that data into red, green, and blue, and it looks like a natural color image that we're used to looking at. The thing with satellite images is it's really powerful because what it does is it takes the electromagnetic spectrum and takes these slices of data and puts it into an image that could have three bands, RGB, or it could have seven bands, or it could be hyperspectral with hundreds of bands. And when we do that, what ends up happening is we can actually analyze data beyond what the human eye can see. And it gets really powerful because you can start seeing things that the human eye can't see. And that's what we use for a lot of mining applications. You can actually look through bedrock and look under the surface of Earth and start looking for objects there. Um, there's also SAR satellites that have become really popular. Uh, SAR satellites typically give us a lot of the weather data. Um, and now there's uh, several companies that are doing commercial SAR satellites, and they're collecting data out here on the radio waves. So they generate images that the human eye has never seen, but you can learn how to interpret it and actually get data. Um, so the good news about SAR satellites is that it collects data when there's clouds and it's raining. So for disaster mapping, you need to know where the flood is and how to help those people and get those people out of there. Well, optical images don't work. Optical images are here. And when there's cloud cover, it gets covered up. Ground gets covered up. But you can turn on a SAR satellite that can show you where the water is going, can show you where the people are, and get them out of there in almost real time. So SAR satellites have a very great, uh, awesome application in flooding cases for sure. And unfortunately, because of global warming and what's happening with climate change, we're seeing more and more flood events around the world. So this is becoming super popular. Um, the third data input is tabular data. You've got a bunch of data that's been collected in um, out in the field somewhere or somehow, and you can either spatialize it by using names and joining database tables to a geometry you already have, or you may have GPS units that give you latitude and longitude values, and then you can use that to spatialize um, your features. So three big ways. Another big concept in GIS is uh, spatial reference lines, um, geography, uh, just, you know, how do we map things on Earth? We all know Earth is a globe, and so we tend to break up Earth kind of on the northern and southern hemisphere by equator. We do an east-west break on the globe using the prime meridian that goes through Greenwich. And then we set up these parallel lines that go parallel to the equator up to the poles. And we set these meridians that go from the North Pole to South Pole to create this almost grid-like fashion so I can go measure and put points down and know where they are on this globe. So the way it works is latitudes go from zero on the equator to positive 90 and negative 90 or north and south. The meridian zero is at Greenwich and it goes 180 degrees east and 180 degrees west. So if I had a point on Earth, I could say the coordinates west and north or Looking at this Cartesian system, everything here is a positive. Everything here is a positive X and then negative Y. Negative Y, negative X. Positive Y, negative X. Just like our standard Cartesian coordinate system. So I can represent it with these north and west, or I can represent them with a minus and a plus. I can represent it as degrees, minutes, seconds or decimal degrees where I take the minutes and seconds and convert them to a decimal number. 
Um, we tend to use decimal degrees a lot in GIS because it's much easier to read than this. Um, so we tend to convert the de degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees. So the one big thing problem we have is Earth is a globe and it's a 3D sphere. And we, we know Earth is not a perfect globe. It's not a perfect tennis ball. It really is a spheroid or an ellipsoid. It's kind of squished on the poles and bulging at the equator. So it's not a perfect tennis ball. It's a distorted tennis ball. And then if I measure everything in decimal degrees, my math gets difficult because you can see these, each one of these little things is not equal. So if I traveled two centimeters in the pole on my map, I would be traveling a lot further than two centimeters at the equator, right? If I just move my point from here to here, the distance I've traveled is way bigger than the same distance up here. So what we need to do is take this 3D sphere and make it into a 2D planar map. And to do that, we have projections. You don't need to know too much about this, but you need to understand that projections are a mathematical formula. And depending on what you want to, every mathematical formula has an assumption and the assumption ends up being errors on your map. So we have a class of Mercator projections that, this, uh, that try and keep true shape and direction, but these guys distort area. So um, with these four distortions, we can have shape, area, distance, and direction. So if you want to maintain shape, which is the most popular map we generally see, you go to the Mercator projections. If you want to represent area and not distort area, look at this map compared to this one. Africa in true is significantly larger. Look at the size of the US here compared to Africa and look at the size of US here compared to Africa, right? Africa is a huge continent, but we normally see it represented by the Mercator, which actually distorts area. And then we've got true distance ones and those become really important, especially when you start getting to the poles. The good news is we're on the equator for Kenya at least. And so projections actually would get a lot easier because most projections have the minimum distortion at the equator. But just recognize every projection has a distortion. The distortion means errors on your map. So when you pick the wrong projection and do something goofy, you could be off by a few hundred meters in the field and you're wondering why you made a decision to drill a hole for water. You drill the hole for water and there's no water. And that's because you use the wrong projection and the real point on earth is maybe a hundred meters away. If you did it right and went to that hundred meters away, drill a hole, you get water. Okay, so it's a... Uh, it's important in terms of using the right thing at the right place, and we'll learn this as we go. Just to give you an example, you know, here's a projection. Um, you can see this perfect circle kind of along the equator and see how it gets distorted as you go towards the poles. Once again, Robinson similar, not distorted at the equator, starts getting distorted at the poles. Mercator projection um, has a lot more distortion at the poles. The equator is looking pretty good. And then we have some very specific stereographic kinds of projections that are very important for, the, for mapping at the poles, but you can see what they're doing elsewhere in the world. They're just kind of distorting everything like crazy. So you wouldn't ever use this projection to map stuff in Kenya because you could have some serious distortions. So we have to put it into, we have to take these globes and put them into a flat world and create some sort of a Cartesian coordinate system so it gets easy for us to measure. To, to do that, we use projections. And there's always two components to a projection. Um, 
You have the geographic coordinate system component, which is defining that ellipsoid or spheroid. The geographic coordinate system is defining the 3D world, the 3D reality of what Earth looks like. And there's many different ones out there. Just depending on where you are, you pick the right one. Because if I was, there's things like, if I was standing on Earth in Nairobi and looked around me and tried to map it, I would have a different picture to if I was sitting in the center of Earth and looking at the globe. So there's Earth-centered datums, there's uh, datums that are centered on Earth somewhere from some location and looking from that vantage view. So this 3D definition is essentially your datum and your datum definition. Um, you generally don't need to know too much about this other than you better use the right one. And we will, we will see, uh, we'll definitely see what we should use in Kenya. If there's other people from other parts, we can look and see. There's some tools out there that you can figure out what it is. But once you've decided it's fine, generally speaking, you're using data that's coming from someone else and they've made that decision for you. Projection part of the coordinates of spatial reference is really taking that second piece of taking this data and projecting it into a flat 2D surface. So now we can start putting it on our computer screen, which is 2D and not 3D. And then when I use my measure tool on my computer screen, it gives me an accurate number as opposed to a goofy number that's wrong. So it's the method, the mathematical method of going from a 3D to a 2D system. And then you have to define it and say, you know, what projection did you use? What are some other parameters? Generally speaking, in software packages, you just use the projection name and it fills out all this stuff for you. So you really don't need to know this, but I wanted you to kind of see this datum at the top here is something that's commonly used in Kenya. Um, once again, Kenya is UTM zone 37. So the datum is ARC. 1960, the projection we used to get to a 2D world was UTM zone 37 south. That puts things into space for relative to measuring things in Kenya. Um, on these layers, what do we have? We have, we set thematic layers, right? So once you've got theme-based data, then you can do whatever. We In the software, we have a name for this layer. We have visibility. We have symbology. So I can make my rivers yellow or, I mean, blue or make my streets gray or whatever it is. So a lot of the software will take care of this. And then you can turn things on and off. We also have a second major concept of data behind the graphic. We've just talked about the geometry and getting this, the space correct. But behind the geometry is data. I have rivers, I have lakes, I have points. In this case, I have campsites and I have a name for the campsite. Does it have a shower or not? What's the elevation? We call this attributes. So they're attributes to the feature. And attributes represent the digital, the, you guys are probably used to spreadsheets and database tables. It's the tabular data behind the graphic object. And you can do all kinds of things. You can do query, you know, you can have categorical data, which is essentially, um, you know, does it have a shower? Yes or no. What type of a feature is it? Cabin, barn, whatever. It's the type of data. It's categorical data. And you can have numeric data, elevation. How high is this? You know, this is the number. And depending on whether it's categorical data or numeric data, you will be able to do different things with this data. You can do mathematical functions on numeric data. Um, you can't do mathematical functions on categorical data. So that's fairly intuitive and simple. So just quick example of types of data. You know, currency type, that's categorical. Highway number, even though it's a number, it's categorical. The number is just telling me the name of the highway. It's not representing like the number of lanes the highway has, or it's not a mat, you know, it's not a number of four, representing some information about the highway. Uh, total square miles, that's quantitative. Yeah, how big is this area? 50 hectares, it's quantitative. Population, quantitative, how many people live here? That's a number. Capital city, yes or no, that's categorical. And average rainfall amount, quantitative. And so just start wrapping your head around what data do I want to represent? How do I want to represent it? And what does it look like? 
And then once you've got this, we can do all kinds of feature um, selecting. We can select based on a name or we can select based on a map, right? And something intersecting something else. But whatever happens when you select something on your table, it gets highlighted on your map. If you pick something on a map and select on it, it will highlight the appropriate attributes on the table. Um, I can do spatial relationships once I have my data set up. You know, which peaks are near a trail? Which highway intersects a certain county or a district? How many trees inside the park? So all kinds of spatial um, relationships are built into the software and we'll see a lot of those as we experiment. But now I can do spatial queries, which a database I can't. In a database I can query on the, date, the tabular data, but this lets me do geometry as well. I can buffer areas and say, what's within one mile of the library? Or how many, um, how many people live within a hundred foot stream so they're probably vulnerable for flooding? Um, we can overlay areas and union areas, intersect areas and come up with new information. I have ecoregions in a county and I wanna know which ecoregions a particular county has. I can union it or I can intersect it. And now I'm creating new data out of my spatial content. My raw data, I take two raw layers, I overlap them and I get a new data set. This is the power of GIS. This is where GIS starts doing things that databases can't. And that's why it's so exciting. Um, so really bottom line is, in the GIS, we're asking a question, we get the data, we explore the data, we analyze the data, and then we act on it. And if your data acquisition or your data is done incorrectly, then everything else is bad. You're making bad decisions and maybe losing a lot of money in the field because the data you fed into the system was bad. So we will spend quite a bit of time on accuracy and assessment of data when you're collecting it. So in summary, um, you know, GIS is a, there to model Earth. Earth is a 3D surface, it's a spheroid, and we need to understand how to do 2D mapping because our screens and our paper maps and everything is 2D. Um, we touched on vector data structures and raster data structures. We also touched on components of GIS. Um, just, you know, what, how, some of the spatial stuff works and how there's a geometry and attributes. And then we're going to go ahead and go into depth on all of these um, as time goes, but we'll be hands-on and you'll be touching and feeling uh, things once we get done with the lecture part. So that concludes today's introduction. Um, hope to see you again. Watch out for the WhatsApp and Tessellations live stream. Um, it will notify you. So I will post these earlier saying we're going to live stream them. Um, so go ahead and subscribe to the Tessellations videos channel, the YouTube channel. So you get notifications when we go live with certain topics and you can join us whenever you feel like it. Also, if you don't catch the live time because you're not there, you can always watch the video afterwards. So having said that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the session for now. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us. Hope to see you soon again. You stop it, Prash?